Man, what an awesome God. What, a, what an awesome day to be in the house of God. God, this morning, as we come to you, we give you our praise. God, we give you our hearts. We give you our ears to hear. God, I pray your Holy Spirit in this place reaches out and speaks to each and every one of us. God, I pray that the, the speaker gets out of the way of the Spirit. The God, that today's topic, heaven and hell, is eternal. So come into this place. Give us a heart to receive. We we'll give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Do me a favor. I want you to turn around and find three people and introduce yourself to them. Hi guys, my name is MK and I am part of the team here at TWCC. Now is the point in the service when we talk about giving and we have three ways for you to do that. So you can text to give, you can give um, your donation to any of the boxes located in the back of the sanctuary, and you can also give online. Now in the back of the chairs in the sanctuary and online, we have what's called a connect card and it looks just like this. Um, take it out, fill it out with as much information as you feel comfortable with, and then you can drop it in any of the boxes located in the sanctuary or fill it out online. One of my favorite boxes on the connect card is the one that says, I'm interested in joining a small group because here at TWCC, we believe that you weren't meant to do life alone. Life happens in those small groups that we have. That's where the connections are made. We are so glad you joined us today. Bye. Bye. I love that part of it. You were not meant to do life alone. That is my favorite box on the Connect card as well. If you're a guest here this morning, we're honored to have you. If you're watching online, we're awesome that you're tuning in. Uh, we had some technical difficulties for our service, but we got it rolling now. Our team, as always, has, uh, has corrected some problems, and so we're rolling. One of the things that, that I love that's going on right now is our small groups. We have about 28 small groups that are all uh, got a ton of people in them and people are doing life moving forward together. And so if that's you this morning, check that box. You got some connect cards in the back of your seat. To those watching online, you can click on that. And uh, we would love to, to plug you in. We would love to plug you in. We've even got some that are online. And so there's many ways you can be a part of what we do. I think oftentimes, first and second service, you can kind of miss out on some of the things like, like y'all get the baptism, right? And so first service doesn't really get to watch that. You'll see some of them come in a little later. Uh, but what y'all miss out, uh, because we always do um, church membership on the first service. So this morning, I want to give you a glimpse of this morning, we had 25, 30 people uh, join our church at TWCC. Those in the top right corner, that's uh, uh, Robert and Amanda, and their daughters just come out of surgery, brutal, just come out of hip surgery, so we want to keep them in our prayers. But I, I believe that healthy things grow, and when I continue to see the people that God's bringing into our doors, I'm just blown away because we are better every time we have one of these. And so this morning we had a whole stage full of people next week. If you've got a baby, you know somebody has a baby, we do a, a baby dedication. We don't do infant baptism, we do baby dedications. It's parents saying that I'm going to commit uh, my child to a Christ environment and a, and a Christian home, and they're going to do that next week. I sent out an email for some reason. I, I messed it up, and it looks like that we're doing it next week at night of worship. We are not doing it at night of worship. We're going to do it Sunday morning, but we do have a night of worship. If you really like the, the praise and worship and prayer, that's going to be next Sunday at 6. We do it first Sunday of every month. And I, I've watched the, the lineup coming up, and it is going to be big and powerful. Last week, we finished it off. We've been in a nine-week series, probably the longest series I've done here at TWCC. We've been in a nine-week series, and we've been asking ourselves the question, are we living in the signs of the end times? And I think that as we've gone through that, we've not only answered yes, but we've said that it is imminent. I, last week, I threw some people off because we were talking about judgments. And we talk about judgments. I understand. I grew up in church, and, and I've heard Revelation taught in many different ways. And, and, and when, you, when you talk about the book of Revelation, most people only pay attention to the two judgments. It's a great white throne judgment and, and the bema seat of Christ. And I, I wanted to kind of clarify this week. When I got up here at the very beginning, this was not intended to be a study of the book of Revelation. Because when you look at eschatology, which is the study of end times, 
You can't just hang out in Revelation because the study of end times actually begins in Genesis. And Genesis through through the, the fall of Lucifer to the fall of man. And then as you continue on through, we see some judgments with the, with the flood and we, we see the, the crucifixion of Christ. But when you look at the signs of the end times, you actually have to look at Daniel, you have to look at Isaiah, you have to look through the Gospels, you have to look at Timothy. And so it all ties in together. I love the interweaving of Scripture. And so last week I talked about the judgment of the nations, which a lot of people haven't ever really heard it called that, but that's the actual name of it. And what it is is it's the judgment of the of the sheep and the goats. And I think a lot of people enjoy the, the gray white throne and the, and the beam of seat is the only two because ultimately it's like, well, you know, if I've done good enough, I don't have to worry about the gray white throne. I can just go get my I can, I can go get my reward, right? Well, what the judgment of the nations does is Christ followers, it really makes it. That, to me, is the most dangerous one. And when you look at that, Jesus lays out what he finds important. He lays out how he divides up the sheep and the goats. And your name needs to be in the Lamb's Book of Life, which is what we talked about last week. But so many people, my fear is so many people do a lot of the right things. Right? I go to church, I got perfect attendance, I threw a check in the plate, I got a bumper sticker, I even got a fish t-shirt, right? And so we do all these good things, but what Jesus says ultimately is, is I don't even know you. You, 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 may, you may do some good things, but ultimately what matters is accepting Christ and then living for Him throughout. And there is a calling that is going to happen. And the reason I'm kind of going back over this is because those judgments are massively relative to today's message because we're done with Revelation. I mean, we're pretty much done, right? The tribulations happened. We, we, we had the rapture. We had the tribulation. We had the second coming. We had the witnesses. We got the Antichrist. We got Satan uh, indwells him. And then we've got Armageddon. And then we've got the judgments. And so, so what we're really done is we're done. But I want to just kind of look back at what Jesus says is important when it comes to the judgments. Because it's going to be massively important. Because today, before you walk out of here, you're going to have to answer a question. And then my goal is for you to go out and ask the question to a lot of people. But when you see the judgment of the nations, what you find is Jesus says, uh, I was hungry. And you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. And, and, and a lot of people ask, well, what's the big deal about this? How many churches are sitting around today, and, and they hate when new people come in? I mean, there's people that, that complain, oh, we've just got too many new people. Is that possible? I'm like, does the kingdom have too many people? Oh, man, I can't believe some more people came across. You know how crowded it's going to be in heaven? No, that's ridiculous. Healthy things grow. And what Jesus says is, is you invited in the broken. You invited in the poor. You invited in the hunger. And you fed me because what you did to the least of these, you've done to me. I was naked. You gave me clothing. I was sick. You cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. You see, Jesus himself set up a standard. He set up a standard that, that, that was going to lead to the judgments but once we get to the judgments there's not a second chance and so that's where we're going to finish off as we step out of out of signs of revelation we're going to step off into eternity everything ties in from the beginning of scripture through the end of revelation it ties in to eternity here's a fact we're all going somewhere all of it ties in. The interweaving of Scripture ties in to one of two places, heaven or hell. The, the crux of what's important to Jesus should be the crux of what's important to his church. The whole study of Revelation it says you will be blessed if you read it. But the whole crux of Revelation is to, to show us the future so that we know how to live in today. And if we know what's coming, if we, if we know there's a rapture, if we know there's a tribulation, if we know there's a heaven and hell, it should directly affect how we live our lives day in and day out. If you walked out of this series over the past nine weeks and it doesn't change you, one, I haven't done a good job, but two, it's just information. And information without action is not discipleship. I believe discipleship is scripture 
in motion. Scripture lived out. And so this whole study was built so that we know how to live today. The why we do what we do as a church is always the who. The why we do what we do as a church is about the who. Everything from the music that we read to the scriptures to the, to the bells and the whistles, everything that we do is about the who. And that is reaching the lost for Christ. And here's why. And this is going to be offensive if you're, if you're really religious. None of the rest of it matters until you get that part right. You can do all the right things. You can do all of the good stuff. Nothing in this world matters if you wind up spending eternity separated from God. None of this world matters if you wind up in hell for an eternity. All of the good stuff is just that. It's just stuff. We've got to get this part right. And make no mistake, there is in eternity. Jesus says it. All throughout Scripture says it. But we live in a world and, and a culture. Our nation is a post-Christian nation. We live in a world and, and a culture that doesn't believe it. And it sounds weird saying that we live in America. We live in, in one of the, the largest Christian nations in the world. But yet there's still so many people that don't believe it. The decision to follow Christ has consequences and it is Eternal. Here's you some stats according to Hebrew for Christians. 107 deaths are going to happen in the next minute. Think about that. Well, we're sitting up here talking in the next minute. There are going to be 107 people die. And when they die, they're going to be in heaven or hell immediately. Gets better. 6,390 deaths per hour. In the hour that we're in here this morning, 6,390 people are going to die and either go to heaven or hell. 153,000 deaths per day. Today alone, 153,000 people are going to step into an eternity in heaven with God the Father or they're going to step into an eternity with hell. 56 million deaths per day year. This year alone in 2020, there are going to be 56 million people who are going to step into eternity. What does that look like? Today we're going to look at what that next step is. We're going to look at eternity because once you take that step, once you die, and here's, here's what you need to know. I, this is going to be shocking. I, I did a lot of seminary. And so I, I have this under pretty good authority. We're all going to die. Like one out of one of us. 100% chance. Unless you, unless you like Elijah. Right? But we're all going to die. And we're all going to spend eternity somewhere. And I, I think it's so hard for us to fathom eternity. It's so hard for us to, to fathom heaven. One of the, the number one questions I get is, is where is heaven? Where is heaven? We, we hear the, the, the VBS, you know, kind of stories of, of where heaven is, right? It's up in the sky somewhere. But the word heaven, when you start looking at, at where is it, the Bible gives us a picture of where it is. But it is also so far beyond our comprehension. Like, like when I talk about eternity, for me personally, and I've been doing this for a while. I've been doing it about 17 years. I still have a hard time grasping eternity. I have a hard time when, when the Bible says he cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. I mean, that's never ending, never ending. It, it's hard to, to wrap your brain around never ending. It's hard to wrap your brain around eternity. But when you talk about heaven, you ask where it is, I believe that, that the Bible gives us a very clear picture. As a matter of fact, heaven is mentioned in the Bible over 500 times. And so I got cute this week because I wanted to know where, where uh, Google thought heaven was because Google's always right, right? And so I took my ways app that gets me everywhere I need to go and I typed in heaven. I just wanted to see where it would take me. Did you know that there is a heavenly burger joint in Birmingham? That's not actual heaven, but I'm going to go try it out. There's a heaven up in, in, in South Carolina. There, was, there were heavenly places, but it never took me to heaven. Now, I did grow up in northeast Alabama. 
And I believe that, that some people, especially after yesterday, would believe that heaven is only three miles from here, otherwise known as Brian Denny Stadium. I believe that there's some of you that believe that hell is, is about 280 miles up in Knoxville, but that's not true either. When we talk about heaven and hell, we ask ourselves, where is heaven? Here's your answer if you're a blank filler outer. Heaven is up and beyond. See, I think the VBS answer is heaven is up. And that's what the, the Bible gives a, a lot of clarity on heaven is up. And it backs up that point. But I think heaven is also beyond. This morning we're in Revelation 21. If you don't know where the book of Revelation is, that's cool. Flip your Bible upside down. It's the first book there. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. I use the NLT version. This is how it says it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, coming down from God. See, heaven up, you saw it coming down, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying and pain. All those things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also says, it is finished. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I had an interesting conversation this week. I sent my notes out to a, a lot of people and, and, and they were like, what do you think Alpha and Omega is, right? Because when you talk about heaven, you talk about eternity, it's just hard to fathom. It's hard to fathom. Like it's a chicken and the egg, right? To have one, you had to have the other. And you could get in this argument that never gets anywhere because it's circular. When you look at eternity, you, you ask this question, how, how was God there before there was there? Right? He breathed everything into existence. So what existed before everything was breathed into existence? Answer me that one. And it gets hard to try to, to, try to fathom. And, and God is, is a God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He was a God of, of past, present, and future. He was here before time began, and he transcends time. But, but for us, it's, that, it's really hard to imagine. But I believe here in Revelation, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The beginning was when he breathed the world, and the end is stepping into eternity. The world as we know it. Is now over. He's making everything new. He's going to live with his children. And he says this to all who are thirsty. Say all. all. Say that again. Say all. all. To all who are thirsty. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings. And I will be their God. And they will be my children. All. God wants nobody to spend eternity away from Him. But heaven is up and beyond. 1 Kings 8.23 reinforces this. O oh Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven above or on the earth below. We see it in Psalm 102.19. Tell them the Lord looked down from His heavenly sanctuary. He looked down. He looked down to the earth from heaven, Mark 16, 19, when the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, meaning the disciples, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. So we see pictures all throughout scripture of, of it coming down, him looking down, he went up. And some of you may say, well, of course it's up. But, but up can be relative, right? Does up look the same to us as it does to somebody in Alaska? Because when you hold a globe, up looks different, right? Or is up just, is up in the sky? Like once it stops turning blue, is that, is, is that I mean, what is up? And I think that, that up is an easy way to describe where heaven is, but I think beyond is actually a more appropriate term. It is up and beyond anything that we can imagine. It is beyond anything that, that our telescopes can even come close to. And we've got some of the most amazing telescopes that reach into, into the outer edges of the space, but, but we can't even fathom the enormity of space because our telescopes are so finite. It's beyond our telescopes. It's beyond our rocket ships. 
We're sending people to the moon. We, we're hoping to send people to Mars, but it's even beyond anything our best technology could begin to imagine and get to. But heaven is also beyond our imagination. It is beyond our imagination. It is something that we just cannot wrap our brain around. We've tried to build towers, Tower of Babel. We've, we've put towers to, the, to above the clouds to try to reach into heaven. But it's beyond anything man can reach into. And it's beyond anything that man can comprehend. And here's why it's also beyond. Because what is heaven going to be like? I get that question all the time. We, we answer this a lot and we do a series called Cow Tipping where people ask us questions and, and we get the questions of, of are we going to eat? Are we going to be married? Are my pets going to be in heaven? That's not what I'm talking about today. But what I'm talking about today is what is heaven going to be like for us? Kind of day in, day out. And, and here's what heaven's like. It's, it's, it's a literal place, first off. And it's like a city. It's like a city. Heaven heaven is like a city that God has prepared for us. What you need to know is that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm coming back, but right now I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's preparing a place for Christ's followers. And, and, and here's the, the, the danger. Is those who don't follow Christ, there is not a place prepared. He has prepared a place for his children. We see what that looks like also in Revelation 21. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had 12 foundational stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The 12 gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl. And the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. I saw no temple. In the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city. And the Lamb is the light. How many of you have ever been to a city that, that while you were there you sat back and said, Man, I just want to live here forever. Or, or, or man, I just, I just don't really want to go home. For me it happens every time I'm in Panama City. I sit there on the beach and... And it's quiet, and, and, and I do what I like to call, I count the waves. And here's the joy of that. They never stop. And they keep coming, and it's just, it's beautiful. And I look out across the expanse, and, and I see sunrises, and I see sunsets. For others, it may be the mountains. You may get out there, and, and the beauty of God, and the birds chirping. Like, I think if there was anywhere I, I would ever want to move to, it would probably be Montana, around the Glacier National Forest. Because when I see the beauty, I just see the majesty of God. I, I actually Googled the, the top visited cities in the world, and there's Paris, right? The city of love. And it's got all the lights and the, and the Eiffel Towers and, and all of that. And number two was London. I'm, I'm not really sure why. But it was London. Number three was Dubai. Dubai has built skyscrapers beyond architectural beauty of anything we've seen in the world. For some, it was Rome. They wanted to see the great Colosseums. In America, it was Vegas and New York and L.A. And, and what I see about all of these is I see splendor and I see beauty and, and, and I see the things that, that as, as, as the world we find valuable. But then when I look at heaven, it's going to make all of the places in the world look like junk. John is trying to describe to us what heaven looks like. And he is using the most valuable things that we find valuable on this world. He is looking, he's saying streets of gold, like, like we're going to walk on gold. Pearls, whole gates will be made of one 
pearl. He, he keeps saying it's clear. The, the, the beauty of it is beyond anything we can begin to imagine. Now, our next series is going to be on spiritual warfare, but, but the one after that is we're calling it old school and, and how church, uh, the, the Word of God never changes, but style often changes. And we're going to dig back into, into some of those old songs and, and hymns and, and 90s power wow. Anybody remember 90s wow or wow 2000? One of my favorite songs is I Can Only Imagine. And, and the, the reason I like that song is it makes me think of heaven. Can you imagine the most valuable things of the earth? The, the, the things that we just set on a pedestal and we said, this is ultimate value. God's using it as a road. That is the splendor of heaven. And John is, is trying to explain it to us. He goes on, Revelation 22 says, And the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. So yes, we're going to eat in, in heaven, but, but the trees are going are to grow the best crops ever eaten. I feel like one of them is going to grow Koneka. That's in the Scott version, by the way. The leaves were used for medicine to, to heal the nation. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him, and they will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Think about it. Think about it. The beauty is so great. No night. No curses. No infirmaries, no tears, no cancer, no COVID, none of the things on earth that bring us down. No anxiety, no depression, no anger, no hate, no riots, no presidential debates, none of it. It's going to be in the glory of the Father where the light is so bright there will be no night. And the best of what God has created is growing from the trees that we can just walk by and pick. It is beauty. It's beauty. But then there's another side to it. There's another side to it. You see, in all the splendor of heaven, there is, there is also hell. I don't like preaching on hell because I think sometimes it sucks the air out of the room and people walk out and they feel all discouraged. But I would not be doing my job as a pastor if I did not talk about hell. And here's why. Because hell is real and it's eternal. There's this annihilation belief that is spread across our nation that there's going to be this point when God just destroys hell. And what that is, it's not scriptural, but what it is is our brain, again, just can't rationalize Hell, an eternity in hell, an eternity separated from the Father. We see it, it, that, that it's real. We see that it's eternal. We see it in, uh, in Revelation uh, 21. It says, 21 verse 8, But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And we see it backed up all through Scripture. 2 Thessalonians 1.9, they will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and His glorious power. We see it in Jude verse, uh, chapter 7, don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which will be filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. These cities were destroyed by fire, and they serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Well, that's great, Pastor, but, the, but there's Jesus, and, and Jesus came to love and set us free. Jesus would never make anybody go to hell. And, and this probably the number one argument I get about Christianity is how would a good God make somebody go to hell? A good God doesn't make somebody go to hell. We choose. Amen. We choose. Amen. It's called personal responsibility. We want to blame everybody else for everything. But on this one, there's nothing but your decision. It's not your mom and daddy. It's not generational. It's your decision to follow Christ. Jesus himself, when it comes to the, to the term hell, talked about it. Matthew chapter 5, you've heard that our ancestors were, were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say that if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, please do not email me. That word is in my translation. 
I know I'm not supposed to say it from the stage. Some of you have translations that use the term raka. Raka means idiot. It's, you're not supposed to call anybody an idiot. You're in danger of being brought before the court. If you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus speaks to it. It's a real place. It's a real place. Jesus talks about it. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out, throw it away, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your strong hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And I think far too often we don't talk about hell until a funeral. Because, you know, when I go to a funeral, and I do a lot of them, I, I, I talk to the family before, and, and good funerals, I know you're like, good funerals? Well, yeah. To be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. And when I talk to the family, and they're like, oh, Aunt, Aunt June, she was a Christ follower. I know without a shadow of a doubt she accepted Christ. She, those are easy. But then you get to these funerals, and, and they're like, nah, I don't know. And you start asking yourself this question, where are they. And hell suddenly becomes a real place. And, and that's where annihilation and stuff like that comes in because, because it hurts to think about our loved ones absent from God and us for eternity. But Jesus talks about it. He says, you have a choice. You have a choice. A good God doesn't make anybody go to hell. As a matter of fact, He provided every way possible for us not to go to hell. He sent His Son to die on the cross so that we would not be in hell. There's not some frozen chosen. He said anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't get any more clear than that. Anybody who accepts Jesus Christ will be saved. But oh, we want to blame we want to blame all these other things. But ultimately, God doesn't make anybody go to hell. It's our choice. We choose. And here's what you need to know. The reason I talked about dying earlier, once you die, choice is sealed. You're going to be somewhere, and it's going to be heaven or hell. You know what makes heaven heaven and what makes hell hell? What makes heaven is Jesus Christ. What makes hell is the absence of Jesus. It's the absence of love. It's the, it's, it's the absence of relationship. It's the absence of, of love with the Father. We see it over and over and over. That Jesus says, I want you to spend eternity with me. Your brief life will last an eternity. Your brief life will last and eternity. So as we look at heaven and what an amazing place that's going to be, and then we look at hell and what an awful place that's going to be, what we need to take away from this is that as a church we have a mission. You see, the study of Revelation again does no good unless it changes our life for today. Who we choose to follow on earth has eternal consequences. The Bible's as clear about it as anything. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. In flaming fire bring judgment on those who don't know God. On those who refuse to obey the good news of Jesus Christ. On those who refuse to choose. On those who refuse to obey the Word of God. On those who refuse to obey on the truth of Scripture. On those who refuse to live a life based on the truth of God's Word, but live a life in the world. Now you're seeing the separation of sheep and goats again. You see it all interweave. And you sit there and you think about it. Here's a stat for you. 65% of Americans believe in heaven. But almost half of those believe that there's many ways to get there, which is a deception and goes against the Scripture. And some of you who are really good at math, you may go, Hi, ah, that's pretty good. Two-thirds of people believe in heaven. Probably going to be there, right? Until you realize how many a, a third that don't is. That's 100 million people. America has about 345 million people. 100 million people are, are heading towards hell. And of the two-thirds, half of them believe there's another way to get there, which means they're heading in the same direction as the first. 
Because there's only one way to get there, and the Bible makes that perfectly clear. You accept the Lord Jesus Christ. 200 million Americans are in the line of sheep and goats. And they're going to go the direction of the goats. But we got churches. We got churches on every corner. And we're arguing paint, and we're arguing decorations, and we're arguing song select, and we're arguing versions. We're arguing whether there's our name on the, on the edge of the pew or who's parked in my parking space. 200 million Americans are going to go to hell. And we're arguing about junk in this world that's going to that's gonna no longer exist. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God lasts forever. It is in eternity with the Father. And so I want to step out of this series. And I want to challenge us as a church. See, I've made, I've made some people upset. Because I preach on the Ecclesia. Which is the church Jesus left. It's, it's not a religion. It's the church that says we should be out with the people. Into the streets. Bringing others. Matthew 25. Go find the ones who, who need clothes. And who need fed. Go into the alleyways. And the church has got to get back and swagger. I do not understand why the church has gone silent. We have a world full of chaos. We have a world full of hate. We have, we're living in 2 Timothy 3. But the church has gone silent. I don't know if we're worried about somebody doing cancel culture or we're worried about somebody leaving the church. But here's the truth of it. The church has got to get its swagger back. And what that is is simply it's a bold confidence in proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. When you filter through the Gospels and and you filter through what Jesus said, He pulled it down so simple. Jesus came and told His disciples, I've been given all authority on heaven and earth. Can I tell you something? I don't have the authority. A pope doesn't have the authority. A board member doesn't have the authority. Your professor doesn't have the authority. Your, Your president doesn't have the authority. Jesus says, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. Go and make our action words. It doesn't say sit and stew. It says go and make disciples. Go and proclaim my name because there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. It says go and proclaim my name, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all of my commandments. Go and make disciples and teach them, surround them, do life with them. Bring others to Christ. Healthy things grow. And the church in America is dying. There will always be a remnant. But we got to get to a place as we come out of Revelation that we realize ultimately this is what it's about. Jesus says there's two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the second one is as great. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't have to go to the edges of Africa to proclaim the gospel. You want to know where people are going to hell? At your office place. In your schools. On your campuses. At your ball fields. And sadly sitting right beside you this morning. There is people in this room They don't know Jesus as as their Lord and Savior. And the world says, live for me. It's all about me. We've got whole platforms that are all about me. And and this aggravates religion because ultimately the mission is to bring others to Christ. Well, pastor, I've come to know Christ, so now I'm not the missionary. Congratulations, you're you're not the mission, you're the missionary. The day you stop being the mission, you become the missionary. 200 million people in America are going to die and go to hell. You're the missionary. And it begins right beside you. It begins with your neighbor. It begins with the people who live on both sides of you. It begins with the people you sit beside every day. It begins with the lady in the supermarket. The Bible says it like this. Then he turned to his host. When you put a a luncheon or a banquet on. He said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back. And that'll be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor. Invite the crippled. Invite the lame. Invite the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you again and intertwine of who Jesus sees as important. The great on earth will be the least. The least will be the greatest. 
Jesus says, go out into the alleyways. Go out to the people who most walked by without a second look. I don't want them to spend a minute of eternity without me. And that is the point of the book of Revelation. So that we can live today with eternal goals. I call it kingdom minded. Not me minded, it's kingdom minded. Everything I do, everything I have, every conversation I have should be focused around in eternity. Think about it this way. The person you talk to tomorrow, if you knew tomorrow was their last day on earth, would you tell them about heaven and hell? And here's how I want to answer that for you. Tomorrow might be. So talk to them. Pride in us says it's about me. Jesus says it's not about us. It's about him. And he's gone to prepare a place for us. Can you toss me up? Like stand up with me. Look at that. In your seat, you're given some communion cups. Go ahead and stand up. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to step into God's promise. What does that mean? It means eyes are up. It means not about me. It's not always on my phone. It's looking around and asking the question. It's walking around and praying to God, God, who will you intersect me with today? It's starting to pay attention to the people around you going, I wonder if they need prayer. I wonder if they need a kind word. I wonder if I can reflect the love of Christ as the seven lampstands. I wonder if I could be the salt that I was called to be. And so I want to do something a little different with communion. Communion, the Bible tells us when we go into communion, if you don't know how to use one of these, this is our COVID communion to go cups. You can pull the top off and there's a a piece of uh, styrofoam. And then under that, there's some juice. But the Bible says very clearly, do not come into this with Christ without coming with a clean heart. And what that means is simply this, don't do it if you got bitterness. Don't do it if you have unforgiveness. Don't do it until you can get your right, your, your heart right with Christ. He will forgive you the way you forgive others. If you don't forgive, He won't forgive you. So why would you go into communion with Him with an unforgiving heart? But Paul makes it abundantly clear. Let's get that right. And then, i got to ask a question. Do you have any unresolved sin? What's in your shadows? What's in the back of your closet? Let's get that right. And then after we do that, when the worship team comes up during our last song, I'm going to do something that's going to make you nauseous. I'm just warning you. I do not want anybody to come out of this series without answering the question. Personally, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I want you to turn to the person during the last song and I want you to ask him, do you know Jesus? Let me tell you how to get there. And if they say yes, then I want you to ask them, is there anything I can pray for you about? And whether you come to the altar or whether you do it in your seat, I want you to pray for them right there. A church in unity and in communion with Christ cannot be stopped. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. And so we're going to walk out of this series in unity without anybody within the sound of my voice having the opportunity Because once you die, the decision is made, and it's eternal. So Jesus took his bread. Maybe. Jesus took the bread, and he said, this is my body. He said, this is for the brokenness of your life. Because he was going to be broken and beaten. And that brokenness is symbolic for our brokenness. And he took the bread and he broke it and he passed it out. And he said, as often as you eat, do this in remembrance of me. And so as a church, we take it together in remembrance of our Savior. Let me take the bread. And then he took some wine and he talked about his blood. 
The blood that would cover all. The blood that would cover all of our sins. The blood that would cover all of our shame. The blood that would cover all of, all of our past. That we can walk forward head held high knowing that we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he gave it to his disciples and he says, as often as you do this, remember my sacrifice. So as a church this morning, we come together in communion, remembering the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. And as a church, we took it together. As I close out in prayer and our worship team comes on up and we're going to baptism, I want you to ask, ask your neighbor. And then this week, as we move out into the world, I want you to, to talk to people. And I want you to, to get your eyes up and be kingdom minded. Can we do that together, God, this morning? I know that we live in a crazy, chaotic world. I know that there's fear of COVID and diseases and whatever the next one's gonna be and elections and economies. But God, oh my goodness. Why in the world are we scared? We know who has the future in the palm of, of his hand. God, we, we see in Revelation that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and that we have an eternity with you. God, I pray if there's anybody in here today that, that has unforgiveness or bitterness or strife or offense in their heart, that, that God, that your Holy Spirit reaches in and you heal them. But God, I pray more than anything, if there's anybody within the sound of my voice that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, God, let today be the day that they get that right. We're about to watch many take that step. God, if there's anybody that chooses you today, God, we, we got a tank ready, God, that they can step from this world into eternity knowing, knowing, without a doubt, that you have prepared a place for them. God, thank you for sending your son. And Jesus, take, thank you for taking the penalty that was out. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
sometimes. I, I've got this list in front of me, but I'm going to go backwards, by the way. We've got some kids this morning. It, it, it just it, it, it excites me when anybody gets back down. We've got some kids this morning. And I think oftentimes that what hangs us up from accepting Christ is, is we've been through the world, right? We've been knocked down and drugged through it. But there is an amazing innocence when it comes to kids. I believe that kids get it. Matthew 19 talks about how kids were, were running to Jesus and the, and the adults were trying to stop him, right? You know, Jesus is too busy. Jesus is too important. And he rebuked him and he said, hey, let the little children come unto me. Why? Because the innocence of heaven is theirs. And I love that. And I love the fact that we have a children's ministry that is investing in our kids. I love the fact that we have parents talking about Jesus to our children. We see all the doom and gloom of the world, but as long as our children are coming to Christ, the next generation will continue to prevail. Amen. This morning we're going to start out with Joe Duke. Joe, come on down, buddy. I've got Joe. Maybe. We do have a little stage fright with a couple of them. And this is his dad, Phil. If you're a guest here, what you need to know is that Phil, yeah, he's a little hot, buddy. We tried to put ice in it, my belt. Hot, hot, hot. This is Phil. Phil plays on our worship team. One of the things that that I love to watch, we're real big on, on men being the spiritual leaders of their families in this, in this church. And I love nothing more than a dad that can baptize his own son. There's something to that. So, Joe, I'm going to ask you one simple question, buddy. Have you accepted Jesus into your heart? You betcha. I love it. Take her away, Phil. Love your shirt. 
shirt that would change the world. You can't read it, it says smile more. You have a whole congregation about to erupt in applause for you. You know why? Did you know that there's angels in heaven that are celebrating? Well, we're super proud of you. I've got one question. Have you accepted Jesus in your heart? Grab your notes for me, buddy. By your profession of faith in him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 